Welcome to the North American Fruit Explorers 2022 virtual conference, um, The Good Fruit from the Ground Up. And I wanna thank you guys for joining us today. My name is Chris Heater and I am the president of NAFEX. And uh, as all of our officers and board members were volunteers of NAFEX. And uh, I just wanna um, do a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, this is a webinar format, not a meetings format. So those of you who are attending, um, you will be uh, muted and off video the entire time, um, but you can interact with our panelists tonight by asking questions through the Q&A. If you use your little uh, arrow and go toward the bottom, you'll see a panel. And um, rather than chat, please use the Q&A to ask questions and you can uh, ask at any point in time and we'll keep track of those questions. And um, it would be helpful if you let us know who you'd like those questions directed to if it's for someone specific. If you're newer to Zoom, you can adjust your screen view and some of the settings on your device. And uh, again, this is going to be recorded, so it'll be made available within a couple of days and it's going to live on our website um, that you can access by logging in 24-7 um, for the next year. And, um, and there'll also be some supplemental materials for some of these sessions that we're doing. So just a few words about NAFEX, the North American Fruit Explorers. We've been around since 1967, and we were kind of a spinoff of the Northern Nut Growers, who have been around for about 110 years. Um, we're a, a network of individuals, both hobby growers, professional growers, breeders, um, you know, just people who love fruit and who are devoted to growing fruit and sharing information with each other. Um, many of us are amateurs, and um, some of us are more professional, but in, in, in all sense of the word, NAFEX was founded, whether we are commercial or hobbyists, we're all amateurs in some sense. We love to share ideas about um, our experiences, about fruit prop propagating materials. Um, we have lots of information on our website, especially for members. So if you're brand new to NAFEX, do take some time to log in and kind of poke around in the back of the website. We've got the conferences from the past two years there, the recordings. We have interest group meetings that you can access, um, lots of good information. So take your time and, and you know, spend some time looking at what we've got back there for you. As a paid member of NAFEX, you're gonna get four um, issues of what we call the Pomona, which is our quarterly. And that um, is sent to everybody digitally, but it's also available for those of you that have signed up for the full membership, you can, um, you'll get that by mail as well. We have 50 years, 50 plus years of the Pomona digitized, and that's on the website when you log in and you can search that by keywords. And our organization exists because of all of you guys, our members, um, again, we're all volunteers and, and members, and we exist simply because um, we still love fruit and we're here for each other. So your membership helps keep this organization going. And you know, it's my, my hope that we'll be here for another 50 plus years. So thank you for your membership and we hope you'll continue in the years to come. So right now I'd like to transition. We have two um, sets of speakers tonight um, and we're gonna do this in, in half. So we're gonna um, first talk with Juan Carlos and Robert from Sober Mesa, and then we'll shift um, to Eric from Savannah Institute. And the session is about permaculture and polycultures. So um, we're gonna focus first on permaculture and then shift toward polycultures and kind of do a little bit of back and forth about some of the differences and um, you know maybe get some dialogue going between the panelists as well. So I wanna introduce Robert Juan Carlos. And um, I actually met them, I want to say 10 years ago when we were taking a permaculture design course together. They had just began their farm, um, Sober Mesa in Unionville, uh, Indiana. And um, they were starting their farm. I had yet to start um, mine. And um, we all learned together about this wonderful topic of permaculture and, and came away with so many wonderful ideas and so much um, inspiration and, and things that we wanted to do. And Robert and Juan Carlos have really embraced that in many ways. Tonight, you're gonna hear about their journey, um, both the good and the bad. And um, they began this farm in 2013. So um, the idea was to have um, a permaculture farm through a collaborative effort with others who contributed their expertise, their time, their resources, and their vision of a small scale operation. Um, their farm, as I recall, was designed by, um, uh, by 
permaculture experts, and they can talk a little bit about that. And they'll show you your design. Um, they decided upon the permaculture approach because it um, had flexibility, variability, and regenerative models built into their growing system. They also wanted to create a community around this. And so they wanted to create community connections through events and educational programs, farm to table gatherings and collaborations with other land conservation organiz or organizations organization. It's been a long day. Um, and they have done a fabulous job of this. I just, I love following what they do. And again, they're located, um, it's really Bloomington, Indiana. Um, and if you're not familiar with Bloomington, Indiana, it's the home of Indiana University. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Robert and Juan Carlos, and um, you guys can just take it away. Thank you, Chris. Uh, let me go back to this let me know okay looks like it is there yep it looks great okay Thank you. Let me close this window here. Okay, so yeah, again, thank you so much for inviting us and it's been a, a pleasure to, to be part of the organization and, and be able to, to participate in many ways with the conference. And I have enjoyed so much this year already, the different um, presentation as well last year too. So uh, we will show you a little what what we have done here uh, from the beginning when we bought the land, and later we will show talk about the practices uh, and how we we go into those practices and go away from others that we started with. So you want to say? Hi, I'm I'm Robert and uh, Robert Fru. And first of all, I think we want to thank NAFEX and certainly Chris Heater for inviting us to participate in the, in the conference. Um, I think really what we want to do is just relate our own story about how we got into permaculture and share uh, what we've learned uh, here in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, in zone 6A, according to um, our zip code. And we're at an elevation of about 850 feet here on this property. It is rolling property. Um, there is a disclaimer, neither of us are uh, educated in agricultural science. Very important to um, say. The only thing we've ever done was take the course with Chris, as far as uh, a beginning, let's say, of venturing into this field. And then we went on and we've gone to Indiana Small Farm Conference. We've attended the Illinois Small Farm Conference. Um, we have read books and went to workshops, hosted workshops, invited others to teach the workshops here. And um, so all of that together has helped us to sort of um, shore up this experience of um, sort of being seasoned um, amateurs. <laughs> yeah. And so we want to share the practices that we found to be beneficial on this piece of land, considering those aforementioned variables of location. Do you want me to go ahead and start with the sure? Topic? So, so let's move to the next. Okay. So this is the original design for uh, for our farm, and permaculture itself is a design system for sustainable living and land use, according to David Holgram, and that was extracted from Peter Bain's book, The Permaculture Handbook. Peter Bain and Keith Johnson uh, became friends of ours after we had attended a Bioneers conference in Bloomington uh, back in probably 
2010, maybe somewhere yeah. around there. And uh, we were invited to it by one of our mentors, Lucille Vertuccio. And uh, so uh, we were fascinated with the presentation that Keith and Peter had given. And a lot of it was about um, water movement, uh, the containment of water, and um, the use of structures around water. Uh, so we felt like it was something that was new for us and yet something that we were very open to learning more about. And so we began that journey of understanding more about permaculture and through this newfound friendship, we um, at the same time we were looking for land and we found a piece of land in Bloomington, Indiana, right on the border uh, of Unionville, as Chris had uh, referenced before. And so uh, we got into an area where there were a lot of old farms and uh, generations of families who had been in the same place around here for many, many years. So we had to make a niche here in a new community and uh, a new town for us. We came from uh, a small town called Morgantown, located in the next county over, over, which is Brown County. And so as we got the land, we had to make some decisions and uh, Keith and Peter were very, very instrumental in helping us and guiding our vision of what we really wanted to do here on this piece of land. Our experience before doing this was simply working with Lucille, who I mentioned earlier, as uh, volunteers for the National Wildlife uh, Foundation, Federation, excuse me. And we were working in the Backyard Habitat Program where we were teaching others as well as helping people to install backyard habitats, uh, which were, were beneficial for native wildlife in uh, predominantly in the urban areas of Bloomington. And we uh, made good connections with churches, schools, businesses, and uh, private homeowners as well as we uh, sort of ventured out into the community, hosted some workshops, we hosted trainings each year to help enlist new people under the fold of the National Wildlife Federation's program and helping to sort of spread that word of the importance of uh, using native plants and thinking about the wildlife that's all around us. Um, I think for us, it was eye-opening when we started that venture with Lucille and it really sort of gave us purpose outside of our jobs, which was really great. It was a good release from something very different than what we were doing. And uh, volunteering was a great way to connect with people in a community where you don't know many people and uh, you're trying to find where you can fit in. So we are, uh, I think, forever grateful to the National Wildlife Federation for that opportunity and certainly to Lucille Bertuccio, who has now passed. Um, so... <clears throat> So let's look mm -hmm. at the design. Let's let's show you the design. I'm going to let you look at this for a moment because visuals um, can really consume your attention. And this has a lot of information on it. Yeah, so on the top of the screen, it will be the north. On the right will be the east, the bottom, the south, and the left, the west. So those locations are important. Um, and we have kept mostly of the design, but there were a few things that have to be changed and we'll explain why. So at the bottom, you will see all the list of trees that were suggested by Keith. Uh, we kept, I would say 90% or a little more. And we lost few uh, through the years for climate uh, diseases. Uh, we got a terrible infestation of Ambrosia beetles and got mostly all the jujube trees, plus other native trees too. We only 
uh, kept or they allowed us to keep one. And but so yeah, so let's go directly to the to the design on the east. Uh, as you see, let me see the course. Yeah, we showed this area here was going to be a barrier because the road is right here. So we wanted something thick to avoid fumes from cars uh, to go to the orchards. So, but that was something that we had to change because we put a, a little orchard of truffles here. And later we found out that truffles don't like competition. And as they say, and so we have to, because they were on 50, Got to be way. 50 feet or more with the root structure of other plants, other trees. Yeah, so that area uh, now is a huge lawn cubal uh, of pollinator flowers, mostly wildflowers. So still the, it, it functions as a barrier, but also uh, it, it gave us a better um, flow, we would see through insects, that we, we want insects uh, helping us. So if you move uh, to the south side, uh, also that was a little different now. We decided that orchard, that south, uh, southeast orchard will be mostly native trees. So we have papas, persimmons, um, elderberries, American plums. I think that's pretty much. Um, Sorry, you grab apples. That is exactly. So, and on the top, on the north side, are, are mostly nut trees. And, and later we uh, inter uh, planted uh, or grafted actually uh, apple trees. And there are a few natives there. So in the middle, uh, uh, right above that blue dot, which we will tell you later, supposedly was going to be a pond, but now it's not. Uh, that's the east orchard where we have almonds, uh, mulberries, uh, apples, pears, plums, uh, one persimmon that showed up there. And um, medlars. Uh, okay, so the blackberries are there, as well as the grapes. On the north side of the grapes is the, the hoop house, and lay, uh, just next to the kiwi, uh, pergola, we call that. And so, and on the west part of those structures is was the first market garden. And on the other side, on the east side of the structures now is the east market, market garden. And so the location of the house also changed. This brown square thing was going to be the house, but now the house is actually a little back here. And on the west, uh, we have uh, another orchard with apples, plums, uh, uh, pears, apricots, nectarines, and in, in these peaches and these lawn things here are hugels uh, with mostly blueberries and some currants, um, raspberries too. And so there is the big structure of the barn and attached to the barn, there is a greenhouse. And, and I think that's pretty much the general layout. So on this west, Pond, which was successful. We have an experiment, it's called a chinampa. We will talk about that later. And, and I think that's pretty much about the design. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, let me say something for a moment. Just imagine that all of this were blank. And that's how we started. So um, in many senses, <laughs> Um, we had not yet taken the permaculture design course. Imagine that before we <laughs> jumped in to do all of this. That's just how much confidence we had and trusted our guts that um, we were being uh, led and instructed 
by uh, really knowledgeable people and they had a lot of confidence in us. So it was a great partnership with Peter and Keith and um, I, we wouldn't be with this now if it were not for, for them, yeah. certainly. Anyways. So, mm -hmm. so now we will go to four slides where you will see the progress from zero ground as Robert mentioned. And those are uh, uh, G, G, yeah, or just anyway, anyway uh, area yeah, pictures. So, uh, so this was in 2012 when we bought the land. So we decided to go to this uh, location because, as you see, the north side, I mean, the north, the west, and the south are pretty much woods. And that for us was ideal because we will protect us from farms. And the closest farm to us that is conventional is probably a mile and a half, maybe. Mm -hmm. And still it's a big concern. And we have the road, as I mentioned before, and you see there. So let's go to next. So this is was 2014. And now you can see the ponds there. And here is the preparation for installing the hoop house. That was the only thing, plus the hugels. This was the first two hugels. Um, and, and there was nothing else there. I'm gonna jump in just, just briefly just to say, so for anyone who's not familiar with hugels, it's hugel culture. So um, it's a hugel culture, which is a, a technique that um, actually was discussed in one of our earlier sessions today. But um, if you Google hugel culture, you can learn a little bit more about that. We will go quickly, not deeply, but quickly through through the process in the next slides too. So this was 2016. So now you can see the barn, you can see the, the high tunnel, the hoop house, uh, the grapes, and I lost the cursor. Okay, there we go. So here are the, the grapes, the blackberries, and this is tons, tons of mulch. And we have a story to tell about in <laughs> earlier sessions, they were talking about free mulch and, and yeah, it's great, but, We'll tell you the bad. So this is the the truffles, and here is the other Hugo culture, uh, and this is the barn where the animals are going to be later. So half for chickens and half for goats. Um, the other Hugos as we talked about before, and here is the tiny chinamba. So, and this is 2022. Uh, so the house is completed and now you can see the market gardens more defined. This is the West and this is the East market garden. And of course this picture is in winter, but you see the little round dots here are the trees. And yeah. Something more, more about the the layout. Mm. Um, I I think that it might be good to share a little bit about the how the grade is on the land. Yeah, you might be able to see that later. You okay. notice, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's. it's it looks flat from the top, but it's not. Mm -hmm. So this uh, is a ground level and you will see the pastures. Uh, in order for us to have some tools and other yeah, things that we need, uh, we have to rent a container. And it's also uh, a sweet and bitter thing with the container because Indiana is quite humid in the summer. So a lot of the things were there got moldy and it was a big mess. Um, so, so now the Hugo culture. Um, there is a little definition, you want to read it? Mm -hmm. So 
Hugu culture is literally mound bed or mound culture. Is a, it's a horticultural technique where a mound constructed from decaying wood debris and other compostable biomass plant materials is later planted as a raised bed. So what we did was, because we had already established a relationship with uh, the person who became a friend, that was the excavator, and he, uh, of course, has a wonderful equipment that everybody wants. <laughs> and you can see from how neat that bed is carved out that that had to have been done by a machine. And it was, not to mention that's a very long bed. It's about eight inches deep. So there are really two approaches with the Hugo culture. You can either dig down or you can simply create your mound flat on the surface of the land. We decided we liked the idea of digging down a little bit. Um, and so you essentially start, or we started with the wood that had to, been, had to be cut around the property to accommodate an exterior fence. And also any things that we could drag from the edge of the woods were surrounded on three sides by woods, which was really ideal. It was a great filter for the farm in many ways. And it also provided us with an abundance at that time uh, of wood and, and debris that we could drag up there and fill in this trench with. You started out with basically hardwoods on the bottom, and then you sort of move upward with softer materials. Uh, softwoods and other things that are predominantly carbon based. You're just filling it in as you go with leaves, with shredded paper, with uh, twigs, stems, um, you know, Christmas trees, anything you can get ground up. The smaller, the better. So you reduce the number of air pockets as you're filling it in with the topsoil that you removed. Mm -hmm. So, so then we, this Keith. is Keith here with the hat on, and then behind him is Mary. She was one of the habitat stewards that we worked with for many years in Bloomington and is still friends with her. Um, and so what we did was Keith brought from his farm several uh, small perennials. There were some day lilies also had some strawberries, uh, black raspberries, things that would get easily started the same day that we finished the, the mound. And uh, so the great thing about these mounds, uh, I'll talk about the positive parts of it first. And once you get the construction over, I think the positive part is that you're able to plant into this really wonderful surface very soon. Some people do wait a full year and allow that material to decompose more and maybe to allow some mycelium in there to develop among all those different um, logs and things that you drug in there. Some of them were already partly rotted and they had hypha on them. And so it was a great uh, sort of a, a micro lab happening there for everything that we threw in there. Um, and on the surface, we were able to plant these things, which uh, quickly uh, reproduced and um, provided us with some fruit the, the following year. And uh, our ideas was, well, maybe we would plant some trees in there after a couple of years. And what we experienced was that we uh, started noticing the, the mound started out at about three feet tall, I would say. And uh, let's say from the bottom where we started on the eight inches below the soil up. And uh, each year they got smaller and smaller. So the material was decomposing well. And uh, some of the larger stumps uh, appeared through the soil and um, as the soil receded, the stumps, of course, remained in place. So you had to continue to bury those uh, 
uh, that was sort of a lesson about better look for smaller stumps next time. Um, but what we decided to do was to try blueberries in this. Well, the blueberries really were not successful. They did uh, survive. And we really never had to water the mound in all the years that we've been here. That really was a great thing that we discovered uh, about this. It, it's very, uh, it's a great technique to use where there's desertification happening or uh, places where you have extreme droughts. These can be very good tools for holding moisture in the form of all of this um, necromass that is under that soil because it really was just a sponge and uh, once it rained the first time I mean it just held on to that and those nutrients and water were really passing through this entire 100 foot long contoured mound on, on both of them it was amazing thing to see how everything looked very even as far as how it was surviving throughout the mound without us applying any form of irrigation. And, and also about that, which is important, uh, talking about water is the infiltration, as Robert mentioned, uh, a year after we started these practices, we, we got a spring down mm -hmm. on the slope and later a second one. And down there is a creek that when we bought the property, they said it was seasonal, but slowly it had water all year round. Mm -hmm. So it worked. So here are the ponds. Mm -hmm. And so we, this is the east one. And we learned uh, that the soil wasn't really the best because we were at the edge of a karst uh, vein, yeah, that's what they call mm -hmm. that. So it had to be moved and he found clay and he thought it was going to work, but he wasn't sure. So the east pond has been always a big problem. And, and there were very suggestions how to fix it, bring pigs, bring buffalo, uh, put bentonite or line it, but we now decided after an experiment we did this year making terraces that is going to be terrace for growing mostly grains. So this is the one that was successful, the West Pond. And now that's how it looks today. And that's the Chinampa, this area here. So the Chinampa is a very fantastic system if you have access to water. Um, and it, I know it's from South America and Mexico, it's called Chinampa, but it's in Bolivia, Peru, it's, they're called uh, Waru Waru. And it is, it's fantastic because the pond has fish, so you don't need to water either. The, the, the water provides all the humidity, the plant and the roots they need, and the fish fertilize. The, the plants. So the only thing you have to do every year because the, the soil will go down is you add some soil from the pond, you could, or from, from outside, doesn't matter. But on here, you see we have uh, strawberries and garlic. We, we try this companion suggested by Japanese practices and it worked pretty well. Those were incredible strawberries, huge. Mm. And, and also the nice thing about this system is you extend the growing season because water deep down is warm. So plants uh, come uh, from dormancy earlier and they also go to bed to winter later too. So, okay. Here are the structures, the barn and the greenhouse. So the barn has a very nice story that you could tell. Okay. Um, you know, when we started the farm, we um, had to look at different options. First of all, we neither of us had a farming background. So the only background we had with nature was the one that we experienced with these backyard habitats with the National Wildlife Federation. 
And, but we got the itch through that experience of uh, maybe wanting to grow our own food, uh, creating a sense of community around us, bringing people to a farm. Uh, farms are not often open to the public uh, unless you're running some sort of a, a business there that is drawing people in. And uh, to share with everyone what it is that we're doing, these new practices, and sort of um, encourage others to think about how they were treating soil and how they were conserving water and uh, only taking their fair share from a piece of land. So we started on this adventure of trying to find a barn. We did not want to build a pole barn. Uh, we really relished the idea of having something that was very old uh, because this piece of land had just been a cattle pasture when we found it. And uh, we once we got the infrastructure in with the driveways, um, then we said, let's find a barn. We got one from northern Indiana from a small town called Decatur. And um, the barn had already been moved previously when they widened the highway up there back in the 1920s, I believe. And so it was part of a bigger barn structure that was all connected to larger barns. And so we just took this smaller section, which is essentially a 40 by 50. So it's 2000 square foot inside um, just the, the section that's minus this greenhouse that's attached. And um, it was disassembled there and brought on trucks. The Amish put it back together uh, in a couple of days. And then it took a contractor uh, a few weeks to put on the siding, which um, is not, of course, original to the barn. The barn's from the 1850s. So this is something called car siding. It's really from the 40s, uh, 1940s. And, but had a beautiful hue to the, the wood. And we just left it all like it was with all that model effect and paint coming off. And we sealed it and um, added some windows from the restore, added electricity. And then we decided we would add on to this lean-to section here that you see a greenhouse, which we got the idea for that uh, through Jerome Ostinkowski. Um, a and, recommendation from Keith. Uh -huh, as yeah. a, again, as a recommendation from Keith Johnson. Mm -hmm. And so we decided we wanted a structure like that where we could actually heat and we could have some of the um, tropicals that Juan Carlos was familiar with in uh, in Colombia. Yeah, I'm from Colombia. So, of <laughs> course, I, I wanted to try to grow things that I know. So when we started, we put some uh, papaya trees, uh, also citruses. At the beginning, we had a lime, a lemon, a mandarin, and also an orange. Uh, this is a lulo. Uh, I I don't know if there is a name in English for it, and also passiflorus. We, we still we do have the passiflorus, and two trees that were these are before we planted them. Um, in English, is sausopia. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's on the papa family, and and the fruit is fantastic. And when I saw the space, oh my goodness, I I could grow even more, but of course they grow and they become the whole thing a jungle. So, but since they're really tasty from there. Um, as you see now, they are more uh, substantial and the papayas, they got a virus. So I had to get rid of them. That was a sad part. And on 2017, also we had a terrible event uh, I I guess on the Midwest, yeah, was mm -hmm. affected by the the polar vortex. So here where we are was minus 37 Fahrenheit. So even with the heater, it, 
the, the, it couldn't keep up. So in the morning I came in, everything was frozen <laughs> and we lost uh, one of the avocados. We lost uh, one of the citrus of the mandarin and, and all the rest, they were pretty much dead down, but they came back, which was a miracle really. That's maybe this would be a good point to pause. I think we're really halfway. You've seen a lot of things. Maybe we should mention something quickly mm -hmm. that Chris also wanted us to mention is the world. So mm -hmm. greenhouses, at least the ones we saw, they use water to capture the heat and release it during the night. But if we put big tanks, we will lose the space. So after researching and the architects, uh, this also his own research, he found out this material on the wall, if you see here, uh, it's all, uh, they look like a little, I mean, it's hard to see, it's like, like a texture. So it, it's called- Phase change material. Yeah, so it's full of little pillows and they have a liquid wax that when it's hot, so the, they're liquid and at night through the temperature going down, they start solidifying and they release that heat back to the environment. And at the beginning, they work fantastic, but later they were creating, I don't know how, holes and it was a huge mess. So that was, was dripping into the soil and so then we have to remove them. Yeah, so let's go to the hoop house. And that would be probably, we could stop here and take mm -hmm. some questions if people want. After this, we'll go to the practices. So the Hoop House uh, was through a grant. And from the beginning, we didn't want to, to grow food like other places that they are just long rows with only one, you know, variety or vegetable or whatever. So it was always very intense and also interplanting different species. And we have perennials there, mostly herbs. And uh, yeah, it's been great. We, right now it's full of food and, and it will keep us through winter and our customers too. So Chris, do you want to take some uh, questions with their eyes, no, we could continue. So I think um, I'll just say that um, for anyone who, has, you know, some of these things like the hygge culture, the um, champagnes, um, Molly has put some um, definitions in the uh, Q&A for anyone who wants to see that and see the spellings of those again. And I think we're just gonna have you keep going so that we can, um, uh, have you talk about the practices and then we'll move on to Eric and then we'll kind of bring everybody together for question and answer at the end. Sounds good, yeah. So um, we started, as Robert mentioned, without knowing much and we follow what we was told at conferences, workshops, at amendments, nitrogen, uh, chicken manure, etc. And we started to to see problems with the plants. And, and what I'm going to talk about, you probably already saw it if you were part of the other workshops earlier. Uh, and so on 2016, uh, through uh, Keith, again, he posted on Facebook uh, a note about Hyde Restrepo. And when I, when I saw Restrepo, Restrepo is a Colombian last name. So I got curious, so I started to look uh, what was he seen and et cetera. So I found out that indeed he was Colombian, but he moved to Brazil to study um, uh, agriculture. And um, he lived there for several, several years. And it was Interesting because also I went to Brazil and lived there for almost a year. So I got even more curious about this guy. So he has created a huge movement in South America about organic farming. And, and the most important thing to me is his idea is rescuing old traditions, uh, 
and give them back to the farmers and, and giving the farming tools for them to create their own inputs into, in, into the gardens or farms or whatever. So, uh, and basically, so we started doing that here after 2016. And it's probably around this picture here. I, yes, yeah. Like now you see the plum trees growing and etc. So we 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 started making bokashi and using teas. By then also uh, I I found out about Michael Phillips and and I read his book several times. And so I combined Michael's suggestions with spraying the trees and also hydros. And we we started seeing results really quickly. So how the trees and the veggies responded, and from there we we decided just to focus on soil, 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 and and forget about the other stuff. Um, so here um, that's the pond that is going to be terraces now on the left. Um, so these are from the the fruits we have right now i mean that they're not that common so that's what we posted them here the chairs the medlars the lime is from the greenhouse and the jujubes and the medlars are still uh we haven't harvested them yet because we haven't really gotten that the, Hard yeah mm -hmm. so that's when they're really at their best um so the bokashi Bokashi, I, I, I call myself a Bokashi uh, fanatic, maybe. So, it, and is what Hyrule does is mostly all these inputs are through, through fermentation, and and they they are really incredible, powerful, and so mostly Bokashi has three big components that is improved soil physics properties, also the soil chemistry and, and the biology. So, which is what you need, especially if you have problems with soil, I think Bokashi will be your saver. Um, and, and, and I believe you will have access to, to this presentation and also I sent to Leslie a video, the only I found in English because all this material is in Spanish and Portuguese. There's not much in English, unfortunately. And so Bokashi, uh, the story how it got to South America was through Japanese immigration to Brazil and early in the 40s or 50s. And later Brazil uh, got a huge movement against the agro industry in the 70s and uh, Luxembourg and later Sebastian Pinheiro and Jairo, which was studying there. So they they got in contact with Luxembourg and, and they were doing the same thing. They, they were finding out old traditions. So the Bokashi comes from Japan, but was adapted to what they were doing in Brazil then. And the, the recipe is just a base, but it's important to understand the process. So you make the recipe on your needs and what you have available at your, at your farm. So here are the main ingredients. So soil, charcoal, manure, um, preferable from rumens. So we, we use the manure from our goats here, uh, but you could use any manure, so chicken, cow, horse, etc. So holes, any type. Um, and what you aim with the holes is that they're high in silica. So you could use rice, wheat, or, or any other material that is high in silica. Any type of bran, rice, wheat, uh, molasses, or any type of sugar to ease to start the process. Uh, rock dust or ashes, if you don't have access to different types of roots, to add minerals and water. So this is a little video and it's an aerobic process. So you have to turn it. It, it takes 15 days to be done. Uh, at the beginning, you, you smell the ammonia from the manure. 
but at the end, the smell is fantastic, it's like really good, good soil. Um, so, and again, on the video that is on, on the resources, you will see detail and Sean, who was uh, at the same class with me in Atlanta with Hyrule. So he made a video, which is great that people that don't speak English could have access to it. So the other big component is the microorganisms. So Hyrule uh, and also Korean farming teaches a very similar way. Uh, Hyrule suggests that you collect the best that you have, maybe a forest close to you. If not, you go to a place that is on the area and collect the top, uh, the organic matter that's decomposing and you reproduce them. So the way to reproduce them is you use molasses again, bran, and, and a little of, of water. So on the first slide here is all the mix. On this one, you pressure them, you tamp the hole on the, the barrel, as you see, to try to release the most oxygen you can. And it looks like that. And later, it will be uh, brew, you say, yeah, for 30 days. So at the end of the process, is ready to be used. So you could use it solid as it is, or you can make a tea from it or on or, or extract. And, and the smell, I, I love it, it's fruity, also a little fermented like beer. So, and also as we say in Spanish, brings people from dead. So a plant that it has a lot of problems, it, it really helps the soil and the plant. So you could be applied as solid as a uh, drink or liquid as a spray. Um, biochar, um, before I saw also was mentioned biochar, I think it was on uh, Jeff's uh, presentation. So uh, these I try to make our own and I, I don't think it was efficient enough. So I now I just buy charcoal and charge the, the charcoal with the microorganisms. And, and again, it's also really great for the soil. Uh, so now how we do our trees. Since I met Hyro, we started to plant the trees differently. So what he uses is a, a square hole instead of a round that we used before round holes and they are on centimeters, so 60 by 80 centimeters. Um, and he uses Bokashi, uh, he uses the microorganisms, he uses the minerals, and you could use ashes or again, rock dust, and, and the, the soil that, that was part of the, the whole. And, and again, the, the trees responded really well, they grow, even faster degrees and quite healthy. So when that's done, we, we call that the donut. I don't know if there is some name for that, but that's what we use. But Robert came up with rings, retention, intention, nutrition, suppression. What it does is so on in having contact with the soil, you add bokashi on top cardboard, wood chips. Now you use solid microorganisms. You cover with hay or straw, a thick amount, and on top you use the liquid microorganism, you spray that. And, and also they, they love that. And as you see in winter, so they create that insulation, which is good for them to protect them in many ways through winter and, and same in the spring too. So now our animals here. So with the animals, it's a very interesting thing in this permaculture. Um, we learn they are important, but it is hard to, to know how to utilize them in many ways because, of course, they have great things to bring, but every farm has is different, uh, I don't know, challenges or whatever. So, uh, the first animals we got were the, the guineas. 
actually the chickens, but they weren't the cook. But the guineas, because we had a really big, big tick problem. And since we want people to come to the farm, we don't want them to go out with ticks. That, that would be kind of bad. And they have done a fantastic job. Um, they provide great eggs, but also they love to explore. <laughs> But we train them so every night they come back to the coop. So that's that's really a good part too. So the goats, uh, we don't milk them. We use them for the manure and for helping with, with the paddocks and improving the soil. And the cats, we had huge problems with rodents eating the potatoes, the strawberries, etc. So we got three cats and they have been fantastic workers. Um, and the, the last addition by the ducks, they were this year, and they really also have done um, an amazing job. They really patrol the whole farm and they deliver their uh, goods and also eat a lot of insects too. Um, here you see the moat. The moat is a fantastic idea from some of the permaculture uh, books or classes we took, uh, but in reality, that huge and beautiful green salad, it lasts two days. <laughs> so, but still we kept it because what we do is we collect the, the soil, we add sodas twice a year, thick amount, and it's already inoculated with the manure, so it's fantastic for the soil too. Um, so we want to mention the great people we have met or learned from. And I mean, this is a really tiny list. There are more and more people. But Haid Restrepo, his page, all the pages that I found, they are also on the resources. So La Mierda de Vaca, Sebastian Pinheiro, uh, Jose Lusenberg, and in the Gaia Foundation, he's, he's already gone. Nacho Simon is especially microorganisms, a Mexican. Juan Jose Panuagua, Costa Rica, Ana Primavesi, Brazil, Lucille Bertucci that Robert talked about, Darren Spree in Peoli, and they have a beautiful farm and great, great plants. Uh, John Kent that advanced in eco agriculture before Tom was, was connected to them in, in, talk in the previous workshop. Dan uh, Kirwich from Bionutrient Food Association, Peter and Keith. Michael Phillips and Ernst Goch, that I probably, uh, the next uh, person will probably mention him. He's a big thing in Brazil, uh, in small Austria, and created a big, big movement of agroforestry, which Brazil is a big uh, component of that. So these are some of the books that have inspired us, and they're also listed on that uh, presentation. Uh, I only have the three here of, from Jeff, but I found out today that there is a fourth one about bacteria, which I'm looking forward to it. And so some are in English, some in Spanish. Um, this is the other he page. And th this woman uh, is fantastic, is German. Uh, unfortunately, there's nothing written in English or translated, but she has a huge research on, again, bacteria. And I think that's it. Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank guys. you. All right. So um, we'll, we'll wait on questions um, and we'll go ahead and um, talk with Eric here briefly. And I just want to point out, in, we thought everyone could see the comments in the Q&A that Molly's been putting in there. And for some reason, they're not showing up for you guys. So we're not sure what's going on, but um, you'll be able to access a lot of um, these, these uh, words that uh, they presented um, in all the supplemental material that, that these guys have provided. And so Chris, it should be fixed now. I'm hoping okay. you can see it now. So. Hopefully Hopefully we can see it. All right, so we are going to turn now to Eric. So originally, um, we were going to have someone from um, Katie Adams from the Savannah Institute. And, um, Katie is is a very under the weather, as I understand it. So Eric is is jumping in here, kind of last minute, and so we're just going to have him spend, you know, maybe ten or fifteen minutes talking about um, some things at the Savannah Institute. 
And um, let me just give you a quick little bio. Um, he's not going to turn his video on because he's in a very rural area, and many of us know how that goes. Um, and maybe Leslie can show a picture of Eric if she's got that. So Eric Hagen uh, joined the Savannah Institute as a Wisconsin farm director, coordinating and planning the implementation of Savannah Institute's agroforestry research and demonstration farm campus in Spring Green, Wisconsin. Eric has an extensive background in designing and operating diversified farming operations, researching and education, educating on agroforestry system application and working with community partners on enhancing tree and shrub cropping systems across the US. You can find out more about Eric's work and the Savannah Institute in general at savannahinstitute.org. So the way this will work is Leslie's gonna be sharing some of the, the slides that he just sent this evening and we're just gonna let Eric talk for a little bit and he will talk a little bit about polycultures and agroforestry. And actually, Eric's going to try and share on his side. And if for some reason that bandwidth doesn't work, then I will take over. All right. Can you all hear me and can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and yeah, thanks for the preface. Uh, I apologize in advance that my, my presentation is pretty terrible to follow uh, Robert and Juan's. <laughs> um, I was building fence all day and and I uh, just kind of ran through and picked some pictures out. So bear with me as I, I try to get through this in an organized fashion. Um, and I'm really excited to join uh, the, the conference today. Um, you guys are all mentors of mine and um, learn so much every time I speak to anybody that's with this group. So it's a big honor being here. Um, so yeah, I'm going to um, chat a little bit. Uh, and again, unfortunately, uh, Katie wasn't able to be here. She is an incredible wealth of knowledge, um, just a wonderful human being, and, and hope you all get a chance to meet her at some point and, and get to learn about her work. Um, and I'm definitely not going to speak to her work. She's operating down in Illinois, and that's uh, a location that I don't know enough about to really want to dive into, into her realm and her knowledge base there. So I'm going to share a little bit about what we've been working on here in, with the Savannah Institute up in Wisconsin. Um, and I'll kind of start off by just giving a, a general idea of, you know, what agroforestry is, so everybody's on the same page, and then run through kind of what we've been doing this year as year one. Um, so we, we Savannah Institute, we tend to work in larger scale commodity uh, agricultural systems. We, we do blend all scales and systems, really, but a large focus of our right now is in a sense, the displacement of commodity corn and soy, or at least diversifying it with perennial systems. Um, we also tend to work a lot within the conservation and restoration communities. And one, one of the big gaps that we recognize within these kind of broader scale agronomy and conservation restoration communities is that they tend to be pretty disparate. Um, our, our kind of conventional system is very much, let's farm over here where the good soil is, let's do conservation over here where the, the bad soil is. Um, and the nature is just way over there, maybe somewhere out, out on the West Coast <laughs> or in the Rockies or, you know, somewhere. Um, and that's kind of a major stereotype there. But one thing that we're really looking at is, and, and this is similar to what Robert Juan was talking about in the beginning of their presentation, is really how do you integrate those parts? Um, how do you really take a, a broad scale system and a broad landscape patterns and landscape use and really integrate perennial systems or, or practices that can help mitigate a lot of the issues that we've come to find out are caused from them. Um, and this is where agroforestry really comes in, um, in, in the work that we do particularly. There's many ways to do this, and the way we focus on it is really about tree crop systems. So by definition, agroforestry is the integration of tree crops with uh, a, some sort of farming system, albeit uh, um, an annual cropping system or even a perennial cropping system like hay. Um, or the integration of livestock. So it really is an intensive and integrative system where you're focusing on the trees as a tree crop, whether it's for timber or for fruits or for nuts or for conservation or wildlife benefit. That is a crop that is a value-based system um, or an ecosystem restoration is a value-based system. Um, and there's a whole number of ways to do that. Um, typically we look at these five major practices, alley cropping, which is the integration of rows of trees with uh, some sort of cropping system, whether it's vegetables or grains or corn and beans or hay. Um, 
or silvo pasture, which is kind of the opposite, where it's a conversion into a pasture-based system. Um, there's two different styles of silvo pasture. Generally, it's silvo pasture by subtraction, where you're looking at degraded woodlands um, and use, utilizing animals to restore those graded woodlands to a canopy that you prefer, or is it part of the goal or objective outcome? Or there's silvo pasture by addition, where you're actually going into a field, an unforested field, and planting trees um, and integrating trees in pasture. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that, how we're starting to do that here. Um, windbreaks and hedgerows, I'll have, everybody knows pretty much what those are. Um, riparian buffers are um, kind of getting a lot of momentum throughout the United States uh, around water quality and water quantity issues, uh, protecting waterways um, from runoff, from agricultural runoff, from urban runoff, from stormwater and that sort of, those sorts of issues. And then forest farming, which is actually integration of understory medicinals or ephemeral species um, in the understory under a timber or under a forested system. Um, so these are generally the five, but really there's a real vast gradient about how, agro how agroforestry can be integrated. These are just kind of buckets to help people understand. But really, you know, just like Robert and Juan brought up, there's so many ways to integrate trees into, into a system. And in a sense, you know, that's agroforestry. You know, the definition's really, really loose. And generally, I don't like to say one thing is or is not something. Um, that can get really tricky. So, um, and I'll kind of talk a little bit more about this as I get into some of the things we're working on. But in, in general, nature agroforestry is, you know, natural climate solution, improves water quality, diversified farm income. It does a lot of good. I'm going to try to speed this up. Sorry, I got 15 minutes currently. Um, so our mission at Savannah Institute, just to give you some context about who we are and what we're doing and why, is uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that is focused on researching and education and demonstration of agroforestry systems. Our mission is about scale or catalyzing the, the development of broad scale um, agroforestry systems and the adoption of, the, of those systems. Um, so we do this in a, kind of a number of different pathways. We focus a lot on the tree crops, um, breeding, selecting, researching, and actually breeding for and uh, improved tree, cropping, tree crops themselves. Um, then we're looking at the actual farming systems, how these how these tree crops actually integrate within a successional system or within a long term system or into a conservation or restoration system. Um, look at how they're, they're the economic and environmental resilience are associated with them and how we can use to deploy them on the landscape, and which is where our stakeholders come in. So we do a lot of education and outreach um, and we work one on one with a lot of landowners and general public on introducing folks and, and helping folks to adopt agroforestry systems. Um, as mentioned, we kind of do this. So one of the one of the broad ways that we're really doing this that, you know, as an organization that's focused a lot on education and outreach that we've realized was a barrier in, in adopting broad scale agroforestry is, is a process of actually demonstrating how it works. As I mentioned, breeding is a major, major part of adopting agroforestry system. If the tree crops aren't working, people aren't gonna plant them. Um, and there's a tremendous amount, like Robert Juan showed, a tremendous amount of tree, plant, tree crop systems out that are already available, um, but they're, they're not available everywhere. I'm in zone 4B and a lot of those crops, unfortunately, I can't grow. Um, and, and, you know, so the, and there's issues in all different plant hardiness zones or all different parts of the country. So a lot of it really starts on finding good trees, finding um, forgotten trees um, and, and kind of recognizing them and working on them from there. So we do a lot with breeding. Uh, we do a lot of with, the, again, the, the farming system R&D, um, but also diff different technology R&D like machine harvesting equipment, um, different GIS technologies I'll talk a little bit about later maybe. Um, and then we actually pilot them. So we're actually demonstrating them through our demonstration farm networks or on the Spring Green campus, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and then use that to actually help to people find land, people find capital um, um, and actually help with on the ground management and design and cost share opportunities to actually help deploy these opportunities. So we're kind of looking to be a full suite uh, system approach. Um, again, we do this through education and outreach. We have a technical support program, research, uh, tree crop commercialization, demonstration farm network, and Spring Green Campus. Um, my role in this in this um, in this organization is the farm director for the Spring Green Campus. Uh, we actually 
in the past year purchased four properties um, about an hour west of Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we are in the Driftless region, so the unglaciated part of the Midwest, a really unique and rare endemic space that was uh, historically all anthropogenically managed by the tribal communities um, for Oak Savannah um, in a lot of prairie. Um, there's also, we live right next to the Wisconsin River, so that's a really interesting and dynamic ecosystem that plays a major role in the soils and the climates, the climate and the culture in the community. Um, the purpose of the Spring Green Campus um, is, again, our, our role is to really catalyze the widespread adoption and therefore commercialization of key tree cropping system and the, the agroforestry approach to, to getting there. So we decided that owning our own property was the best way to go simply because it's very challenging to have a very long-term lease. Wisconsin state constitution actually does not allow any lease to go beyond any land lease to go beyond 15 years. So when we're talking about tree crop readings, we're talking about 50, 60, 70 years out, um, 20 years out at a minimum. Um, so as an organization, we decided in order to really do good long-term protracted research on everything from breeding to carbon sequestration to nutrient management to nutrient cycling, we really need to be able to track these systems long-term. And we need to be able to have unfettered access and kind of reduce the complexities that come with leases or partnerships um, in different forms of engagement, which we're still doing. But on the campus, it really gives us unfettered control and ability to do kind of whatever folks are interested in seeing us do, or whatever ideas we come up with, whatever research projects we can scheme up with and get funding for. Um, so again, a lot of breeding. We have a tree crop nursery. Um, we're scaling commercial pilot farming systems, which I'll show a few examples in a moment. Um, doing a lot of large scale silvopasture research and demonstration. Um, and doing a lot of natural ecosystem restoration, where, it, like I said, we are in a endemic savanna ecosystem, a very rare and special place. Um, so we're really looking at uh, working with the communities, the tribal communities and the restoration communities and helping us kind of look at restoring those native ecosystems that exist here and how we can bring that back into, a, a, into an agronomic system. And then we utilize the campus as our education hub and base um in the tangible world we do a lot virtually nowadays um but it, this gives us a great space to have a kind of enhanced apprenticeship program um a lot of field days and workshops and that sort of thing where people can really get involved and engaged like robert once said this is uh becoming a public farm where we in, invite a lot of people out to the site this year alone we've already had over 300 people visit the site and this is just year one um so because I didn't have enough time to bring up my all my designs um, and make them understandable on a PowerPoint, um, I just kind of made a few arrows. <laughs> so there's a lot going on with this site, this property here. This is the, um, like I said, we have four properties. I'm going to talk mostly about the North Farm. Um, the North Farm is 330 acres right along the Wisconsin River. Um, about 225 acres of it is forested with some remnant prairie savanna intact with needing some management, um, some timber management. Um, we're actually engaged in a state level program to do some timber management, which will integrate some forest farming practices. There's already ginseng and golden seal uh, planted in this area by the previous owner. Um, we're doing a lot of development for silvopasture. So as of this week, we got half of this property actually fenced for livestock to come on the property starting in spring. So we're gonna start with uh, sheep um, and start getting into custom grazing with cattle. Um, we planted a seven acre uh, hazelnut pilot farm, which I'll go into details in a little bit, um, and 10 and a half acres of chestnuts. Um, and then we're starting to work on the, the riparian zone and starting to manage for those, ecos those kind of native ecosystem. Um, this is what the property looks like as of, I guess, a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is the, the Wisconsin River in the background. Um, this is the hazelnut pilot farm. Um, they're, like I said, seven acres. What's unique about this, this pilot farm is um, it is actually comprised entirely of clonal layers. So, the, so hybrid hazelnuts is something we're, we're researching and focusing on and working with a lot of different partners on. Um, Historically, in the Midwest and the East Coast, hazelnuts have primarily been a seedling operation. Um, 
because clones of hybrid hazels, these are uh, hybrids of European and American genetics um, or straight American selections, these really struggle with different propagation techniques um, that are scalable. Um, and seedlings are still discovering the best new genetics that are out there. But in order for it to be a commercially viable um, farm, an industry at scale, they need to be machine harvested or at least be able to be harvestable at a larger yield than, than you can do by hand um, easily. So in order to do that, seedlings are uh, not the ideal route to go. They, they don't ripen at the same time. They can actually ripen within weeks apart. When in a machine harvest, you need each row to ripen at the same time. Um, so with a clonal propagated system, you actually get every single bit. If you can barely tell in this image here, but every there's actually 12 rows of hazels. Um, every row is a different genotype, clonally propagated. So every row is the same exact tree and every row pollinates the next row downwind. Um, so this is very much like a standard apple orchard or a standard orchard of any production system type. Um, and the idea is that we will be able to machine harvest down the row, each row, and have you know, diverse genetics within, within this field here. Um, here's another image. Uh, kind of can, can kind of see the topography of this landscape. It's very dynamic, um, a lot of water. The soils here are very sandy. Um, they actually, you can see three different blocks. We go from sand, silt to clay. So this is kind of set up actually, actually as a research plot um, to look at the, these different genetics across different soil types. And then I'll talk about the ch chestnuts planted here in a few minutes. We actually alley crop this system as well. So you can kind of see this is very early on when we planted this. Um, we pl planted this block to oats. This is all in alfalfa. And then we did vegetables um, and cover crops in this, what we call block one um, to demonstrate an alley cropping system. So right here, I'm assuming y'all can, can see my uh, pointer, mouse pointer. Um, this row here is the haz is a hazelnut row. There's one here, here, and here. The, the hazelnuts are 25 feet apart. And we did potatoes in, in between these two. Um, we did carrots, we did beets. Um, and like I said, a whole number of different cover crops. Um, really, because this is sand with a uh, organic matter of 1.8, uh, at this scale, compost and manure is very difficult. Um, and so the best thing we can possibly do is compost in place. So growing a lot of green manures, doing a lot of biomass incorporation. Um, by calculation, this sorghum sedan mix gets about 10 tons to the acre uh, biomass each year. Um, versus uh, this buckwheat, which is probably about at best two tons to the acre. Um, but the, the, bio, the buckwheat is tremendous pollinator habitat um, for a sh pretty short window of time. Um, we also do a lot with uh, Gary Zimmer is a local partner in the area and he is a um, organic farmer and uh, organic supplement mix master. Um, and he's working on a activated composting system and program. So what we did was a uh, number of soil, te we tested the soil, um, did base, found base recommendations for hazelnuts and actually mixed a compost, a fertilized compost um, at, you know, we, I think we got about 56 tons um, and then applied it just within the hazelnut rows to get the hazelnuts a good start. And then we applied uh, mulch on top of that. We have a side discharge mulch spreader, which made that job pretty easy. We we're actually able to get in. We planted the carrots and actually applied the compost and mulch over the carrots just to kind of figure out how this alley cropping system could work. Could we still have a crop in between the rows of the hazelnuts and still manage the hazelnuts effectively? Um, and so this is year one on these hazelnuts and they're looking absolutely fantastic. We're also doing, because we're at scale, it's, uh, it's really difficult to figure out the, the fertility management another, uh, or even mulching or weed management. Another approach that we're looking at is chopping in place. So actually growing a cover crop between the alleys of the hazelnut. Believe it or not, there's hazelnuts running down this irrigation line here. This was right after planting, uh, a few weeks after they leafed out. Um, we actually ran this old green chopper, which is made to just chop alfalfa or sorghum and throw it into a wagon and take it to a confined barnyard and feed cows out of a wagon. Um, we were actually just driving this machine over. It's a flail mower and it shoots right out of the chute, right in place onto the hazelnuts for 
kind of a direct in place mulch. This is actually an alfalfa plot that we did this on. It's a very high nitrogen. Um, actually ran into some issues with the nitrogen, but next year, but by actually by fall, these plants really started to explode. We're also doing a number of different cultivation techniques. Um, we are operating this farm organically, which is also something that's very challenging and difficult with hazelnuts or the establishment of these systems directly into it. I might not have mentioned, but last year this was a cornfield. Um, actually, all of this farm was a cornfield or alfalfa field, um, which so it's very difficult to come out of a conventional system into a tree cropping system, um, and especially organically. So we're doing a lot of different trials and methods on different organic establishment practices. Um, I'll kind of get into chestnut. Oh, nope. Um, I'll jump to this one. So actually this is a, a farm that's down the road from us. Um, this is our research farm. As I mentioned, we do a lot with breeding work. So the farm that I was just showing you, this, this is the clonal layers of, of long-term selected um, hybrids that were developed by Phil Rudder and Mark Shepard. Um, and selected by Lois Braun and Jason Fishbach at the University of Minnesota in Wisconsin. Um, Carl Weschke had a hand in a lot of these genetics. There's just a, a tremendous community background in the development of these, these genetics. Um, and we're actually helping in the system by um, plant, we planted a 15 acre block of controlled crosses of those clones. Um, so the best by best crosses were made to um, develop this orchard here, which is uh, controlled cross seedlings of all the best hybrid hazels that we have available now in order to continue exploring further more and more uh, genetics for a commercial hazelnut uh, system for the Midwest. Um, so this farm here is really awesome. There's this, uh, the Spring Green Nature Preserve here. It's, a, it's one of the last true remnant sand prairies in the United States. Uh, the, the Nature Conservancy manages this site. Um, we're a project project partner with them on a number of different projects. So really excited about having, integrating some prairie into this site and, and working on these, on these different projects to kind of help with the, the natural restoration of this, this community. Am I running out of time? <laughs> I see Chris jumped on. Yeah. yeah, so maybe five more minutes and then we'll just run a little over this evening with the Q&A if that's okay with everybody. Sure, yeah, I'm almost done actually. Um, another thing that we worked on this year is chestnuts. Um, so like I said, we planted about 10 and a half acres of chestnuts. Um, you kind of see them in the background here. And this is a four acre field. This is a six acre field in the background. Um, this is a cold hardiness research project. So this was is planted at double density, uh, 40 feet between rows, uh, 10 feet in row uh, between trees. Um, this is planted to be grazed. So this is pasture that was seeded out. This was a cornfield last year, planted the pasture this spring. Um, I'll be grazing it next year. The, there's 72 different uh, genotypes or seedlings from 72 different mother trees. We know the parents or the maternal parent, but we don't necessarily know the paternal parent of all of these seedlings. These were collected from some of the best uh, chestnut breeders in the US, Bob Staley, Greg Miller, Tom Wall, uh, Richard Winkle, a um, number of great folks doing wonderful things with chestnuts. These are primarily hybrid chestnuts, Chinese and American. Um, where this project is really about exploring cold hardiness. Like I said, we're in zone 4B. Um, so I'm expecting about 50% survival on this stand. Um, and that would, I would call that a success. If we get more, then I'm going to be thinning trees and being able to select out for a lot of the traits that we're actually looking for. But right now we're really looking for cold hardiness. This is a six and a half acre planting on the other side of the farm, kind of a difficult view to see. Um, but the idea here is that we're planting, we're going for the chestnuts because we have a research project focused on the chestnuts. But really, this is about giving us the backbone to start integrating other polycultural systems. Um, I know this session was about polyculture. We're not doing polycultures at the moment because we are looking at scaled systems. But the idea here, because we're on zone 4B, we're really pushing the northern temperate climate. We were able to get some of the best genetics and really be able to help people source the best genetics that are going to work here. Like I said, I'm expecting about 50% survival. If I get 25% survival, this system will become a polyculture system. I'll start to integrate more hickories, more persimmons, uh, mulberries, black locusts, um, directly in with these rows of chestnuts. If I get 50% survival or greater, 
we're going to keep this as a chestnut orchard and go for production scaled chestnut because this the soil type is perfect for it it's everything that you know best chance wisconsin has in this part of wisconsin for really exploring a a, a you know some of the the known available genetics for a chestnut orchard in this area um but it, but in theory this could also translate into something much more complex much more dynamic um we also did a very substantial nursery this year we did about three acres of uh, tree nurseries um we did elderberries chestnuts um got about 13,000 chestnut seedlings uh, available for sale through the Canopy website. It's a partner, a uh, project partner of ours. Um, we did persimmons, hickons, pecans, uh, shagbark hickories, butternuts, heartnuts, um, all sorts of good things. And this is ex being expanded next year to include a lot more diversity, uh, and pawpaws and all sorts of fun things that's specifically geared towards zone five and zone four uh, is what we're hoping for. Um, I mentioned a lot about restoration. We have a lot of restoration projects and a lot of uh, a remnant oak savanna on the property and doing a lot of grazing. Uh, this is examples from a, another one of our farms on the other side of the Wisconsin River. This is a, an organic grazer that we partner with, Seven Seeds Organic Farm, um, and on, a, on our silver pasture site there. Um, we'll be integrating more trees into this site. Um, this would be like along these kind of curved Fence rows um, will be a lot of, uh, hopefully planting a lot of chestnuts and oaks and hickories. Um, uh, boy, poplars uh, is a fast growing shade tree. Uh, as you can see, this part of the fields are very wide open versus the savanna up here. They have a lot more shade. So we're looking at integrating fast growing shade trees, deciduous trees specifically in this um, and something that provides a lot of forage and fodder for the cattle. Um, and kind of enhance the diversity of this site. Um, we do a, a ton of research uh, on these projects. So we're really, you know, we're doing a lot of these plantings really to focus on providing information to the community. So uh, we're doing a lot of measurement on nitrogen, phosphorus, and runoff and carbon sequestration. Um, so we just did a, I think, got over a hundred, one meter deep cores across uh, just North Farm alone. Uh, in the hazelnuts and the chestnuts and in the corn. Um, we still rent out half the acreage to uh, uh, the, the dairy farmer next door. So really being able to understand what are the dynamics and differences that these systems kind of translate over time. Um, and then be able to, to build tools, uh, GIS tools, to be able to map those, those systems, figure out uh, you know, what genetics and tree crops work over vast arrays of landscapes. Um, and be able to kind of help understand about how agroforestry can help change and, and enhance the ecosystem services that we're looking for across the landscape um, and helping different project partners like the USDA and NRCS and Nature Conservancy and all sorts of different folks working on you know, enhancing and restoring our native ecosystems um, through enhancing farming systems. So there's a lot of ways to get involved, a lot of ways to connect with us. Um, I see Jen Rip is on here. She's doing a lot with our uh, apprenticeship program um, and doing a lot with uh, the, our perennial farm gathering, which is coming up in December. So I encourage all of you to join that or even give a nutshell presentation on that if you're interested. We're always welcoming uh, guests. Just let me know if you wanna come out to the Springer campus. We do tours quite often. Um, so keep an eye on our social media for different tours and trainings and things like that that are available. Um, sorry, that was really fast. There's a million and one other things I wanted to talk about, but I tried to fit that in 15 minutes and I did not. So that is okay. Thank you, Eric. Um, so let's see a couple of things. We're still not entirely sure if everyone can see the Q and A. That's a weird glitch that we experienced tonight that we haven't experienced earlier today. Plus, there's a lot of crazy emojis going on, which we think is a glitch in the program. So. I apologize if that was a little distracting, but we're not sure where that's coming from. Um, so let's first go back. Um, a couple questions for Robert and Juan Carlos. They can bring themselves back. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so uh, one question is, first of all, uh, could you tell us how many acres are on Sober Mesa? Nine, but really with the orchards, no more than four. Yeah. About four or five acres are really are farmed. 
Okay. Yeah. Great. And then someone says from your original design to now, how many uh, um, of the interplanting of chestnut, hecan, and heart work, uh, heart nut worked out? And what was the spacing between them? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, last year, for the first time, we got flowers on the uh, English walnuts, yeah? Mm -hmm. The hard nuts, they haven't produced anything yet. Uh, but the hazelnuts are crazy. They're always really abundant. And the spacing... I think it was 20 feet. 20 feet apart with the big mm -hmm. ones, yeah. Yeah. Okay, 20 feet, all right. Mm -hmm. All right, let's turn a couple questions to Eric. Um, Eric, Doug asks, could you share the hazelnut and chestnut cultivars that you're working with? Oh, that's, yeah, I can, but how, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> um, the hazelnut, so the hazelnut, so a couple, one of the, one, oh man, where do I start? <laughs> So the hazelnuts is a big project with the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative, the UMHDI program. Um, and that's been the program that's really done a lot of selections on following up on Phil Rudder's work from Badger Set Farm um, and Mark Shepard's work, who's continued to, to do a lot of selections there. Um, and also work from uh, Rutgers University has a number of different um, uh, cultivars that they're working on for EFB resistance, um, not necessarily cold hardiness resistance. Uh, we also uh, working with uh, a number of uh, genotypes from Grimo, um, Grimo Nursery, and they have um, a, a number that are actually an Asiatic hybrid uh, with Americans, um, a, a number that are just pure American selections. Um, and so, yeah, it, right now we have 12 different genotypes as clones. Um, and a lot of them, I see another question is, you know, are they going to be available? Um, I would, and that's really where the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative really comes in. If, if you're looking for clonal layers, um, they're going to be releasing a number of them really soon. Grimo has a number of layers available. Actually, there's a lot of layers coming out of Rutgers right now and at um, Night Hollow Nursery. Um, is coming out with a lot. Um, so there are layers that are are coming out more and more online. Um, just kind of have to dig for them and, and they're selling out pretty quickly. In terms of chestnuts, uh, like I said, there's 72 different mother trees that um, it, it's, it's really the gamut, but primarily it is a Chinese with some American pollen in the, in the in the orchards there, um, or even just, or even a lot from Badger Set that are, that are, you know, known American Chinese selections, um, or even we have none that are known pure Americans. Um, just a lot of hybrids and complex hybrids. I don't know how else to go into that without taking way too much time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, Natasha asks. She said. Um, Protection from deer has been discussed in a couple of our previous sessions. Um, and she says, if you recall, you we all you all were um, using a pretty cool two layer wire fence to protect from deer. Correct her if she's if you're if she's wrong. And would you mind explaining how that works? Yeah. Um, so we actually implemented the Premier One supply system. Um, and so Premier One Supply is a livestock fencing supply. They sell a lot of uh, temporary netting and, por and portable fence specialists, I would say. Um, they came up with this 3D, they call it the 3D deer fence. So it's two rows of fence and actually we, in just three lines. One, the outside row is one line at 32 inches. And the inside row is two lines at 18 and 48 inches. Um, and the two rows are anywhere between three to five feet apart. Um, I wish I had a picture of it available, but I don't. Um, we do our, our fence rows five feet apart because that's what my mower size is. So I can actually mow in between the rows three feet apart. You tend to get a lot of weeds growing in there and that actually shorts out the fence. This fence is electrified and does need to be electrified to actually work. Um, and I have to say we implemented over 60 acres of it this year and it's 100% effective as long as it's electrified. <laughs> 
And we, we are in South Central Wisconsin. We are in whitetail, legendary whitetail hunting paradise. I mean, we, I have so many pictures of 10 to 14 point deer. People are excited about that sort of thing. Um, this is, this is kind of deer hunting Mecca, if that gives any perspective on how prevalent the deer are and how difficult this, this is and how exciting it is to see how well it does actually work. So I definitely recommend, um, it's 73 cents a foot is the other thing versus 10 foot deer fence, which is around $9 a foot. Um, so the cost saving is pretty tremendous. It really, really makes for a large scale system actually be viable for folks to actually get into. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, Chris Homanix asks, what potato varieties, beet varieties, and carrot varieties did you grow and any highlights on that? Huh, of course you would ask that. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we did a, we did a whole number of potato varieties. I think six different potato varieties. We have a, a local farmer in this community, Vermont Valley farm. That's a very well-known uh, potato seed farm. Um, they specialize in some kind of niche specialty potatoes. Um, so like your Adirondack Reds, your Corollas, um, your Oneida Golds, um, th things like that. Um, so we did, we, we worked with a lot of them just because they're local and we are looking at the, the specialty crop program. Carrots, we just did storage carrots, boleros, um, and beets. We just did basic, you know, chioyas, reds, um, and boulder which is a, a somewhat improved golden beet um we kept things pretty simple uh chris knows me well i come from a pretty extensive background <laughs> specializing i mean we both work together doing a lot of specialty see i mean he's way beyond me in it by any means but a lot of different specialty stuff um we're trying to simplify things with the veggie operation <laughs> at this scale um but it's pretty exciting to like, to really, you can really do a tremendous amount uh, of things in between tree crops if, if setting things up in an alley crop uh, quite well. And we've learned a lot about how to do that and really excited about how to share how to do that. Great, thank you. And one final question uh, for you, Eric, uh, how has cover cropping helped the soil health and probably assisting in insect control? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, you know, on our scale, like, like I mentioned, it's kind of, it's really difficult organically to, to amend and improve soils with, with imported materials. Um, like I said, we used about, uh, I want to say it was something over like 50 yards of compost just for the 15 acres at Valley Farm, which was the research planting, and then this seven acres here. So that's 22 acres of hazelnuts, um, but that's a lot of material. Um, and to, to do any fertility manage between the rows is, is really difficult without a steady manure source. And that would have to be bought and paid for. And so, you know, growing green manures is, it's pretty tremendous how well it works and, and how many, how much is available. Um, you know, you got rye that does really well in the winter. Uh, the root structure of rye is tremendous. It can break up hard pans. It can break up compaction. Um, and, you know, any of the material that, is either taken off or mowed down in the in, in the spring. You're killing off that root structure. That's just organic matter being converted in the rooting zone. Um, you know, we do a lot with uh, clover. Uh, we put about I don't know, 15 acres of just clover in. Um, and watching watching the improvements of the soil with just mowing clover repeatedly over over your, or pasture. It, you know, is the same thing. Just mowing and converting to perennial, you watch the system change pretty tremendously. And, and just real quick in terms of insect control, that's a very complicated conversation. One that I don't think I can dive too much into now, but in terms of habitat and diversity, like I said, this farm has been managed commercially, uh, conventionally for at least 40 years prior. And previous to that, it was, you know, traditional farming system practices. It, the, the biology here is obviously alive. It's a very dynamic site. There's remnant prairie, savannah, there's some Wisconsin River right across the road, but infield, it's pretty disparate. Um, this 15 acres of clover that we planted, I've never seen so many monarchs in my entire life. Wow. Every single day at five o'clock in the evening, you walk out and there are thousands upon thousands of monarch butterflies flying around, hitting every single clove flower and clover. And that's just year one. 
that was just from reseeding, you know, seeding co clover, cover crop, and reseeding to pasture. And in the pasture, we did chicory, plantain, clover, and all the grasses. So that, I mean, just by incorporating diversity pretty simply in the landscape and incorporate, especially cover crops, especially in a kind of an annual farming system, it's pretty tremendous how well it works. If that's a value you're looking for is improved soil management, soil health, like I said, that's a whole conversation. We, we did a whole actually field tour just on soil health, health with NRCS a few weeks ago, but it's, it's pretty phenomenal. And there's a lot of resources out available to how to do that, how to do that well and the timing of those sorts of things. There's a lot of species out there to work with for sure. Yeah, great. Well, thank you. I want to thank um, all of our panelists tonight, Eric, uh, Juan Carlos and Robert for taking the time to um, present um, all this great information for us. A reminder that this has been recorded, um, including all these crazy emojis that you're seeing. Um, and it will be available in the next couple of days. And then all of the supplementary, supplementary material that um, has been mentioned will be available as well. And uh, just a couple other things. Um, let's see, we have two more sessions tomorrow um on um apple breeding um just a wonderful set of panelists for that and then um Stephen Elholm for our final um presentation tomorrow and um if again if you're new to NAFEX make sure that you take some time log in using your email address you can find all past recordings from the 2020 and 2021 conferences the interest group meetings that we've held you can access the Pomona back issues of the Pomona um, we still need to get the latest issue of the Pomona up, but you can see all the other issues and you can search those Pomonas by keywords. So a lot of good information, um, an Apple pedigree tool that's there, a pear pedigree tool that Eric, our, our fabulous website volunteer has put together. Um, so I encourage you guys to get onto the website and check those things out, especially this winter when we can't be outside enjoying um, all the fun things we do outside. So again, thank you guys for joining us this evening. Um, thank you to uh, Leslie for being the wing woman in the background, making sure everything was running smoothly. And thanks for um, Chris Homanix for bringing Eric on here last minute to kind of pinch hit for Katie. And again, thank you all. Leslie, if I missed anything. Nope, we've got it. And tomorrow we've got Apple Genetics in the morning, which is going to be very, very cool. Apple ID and Genetics, old school and new school. So it's going to be cool. Yes. So thank you guys for hanging out with us tonight. Enjoy thank the rest you. of the evening. Um, if everyone you. wants to say, well, can't, we can't, we're not, in, we're in webinar, so we can't come back on screen. So <laughs> we'll wave for everybody. <laughs> exactly. We're all, we're all in it together. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.